Our speaker today is Devanush Dasgupta, and I'm really excited because he's an old colleague and also an old friend of mine. Um, Devanush Dasgupta is a doctoral candidate in the Department of Women's Gender and Sexuality Studies and the South Asia Studies Initiative at The Ohio State University. His research interests are broadly related to the intensification of neoliberalism and biopolitics in contemporary United States and India. Debanu's dissertation is titled Racial Politics in Contemporary United States and India. Debanu's, uh, I'm sorry, his dissertation analyzes immigration regulation related to HIV, AIDS, transgender asylum, and the formation of racialized queer migrant subjectivity within the past two decades in the US. That's a mouthful, I know. You'll have to ask him about those things later. Uh, Devanuj maintains a uh, strong secondary research interest in the relationships between Hindutva, uh, neoliberalism, and sexuality politics in India. He currently holds a graduate administrative associate position in the Moral Scholars Program at the Office of Diversity um, and Inclusion at the Ohio State University. In this capacity, Debanuj is responsible for creating social justice related academic enrichment programs for the largest diversity leadership program in the country. He is actively engaged in university governance and serves as the chair of the Diversity and Inclusion Committee for the Council of Graduate Students. Debanuj is the graduate student representative on the University Senate Diversity Committee. He has worked for over 16 years across two continents in the civil society sector. In 1994, Debanouche founded the first HIV prevention program for men who have sex with men in Kol Kolkata, India. His work in the U.S. has largely been within the environmental rights, sexual rights, and immigrant rights movements. Debanouche has received numerous grants, awards, and fellowships, notably the Association of American Geographers T.J. Reynolds Award for Disability Studies, the Space, Sexualities, and Queer Research Group of the Royal Geographic Society Institute of uh, British Geographer Scholarship, uh, Arts and Humanities Graduate Research Small Grant from The Ohio State University, the Ford Foundation Academy for Educational Development uh, New Voices Fellowship, Together. Of, of which he and I both were fellows, and that's how we met, um, Graduate Research Fellowship from the University of Akron, and the International AIDS Society Fellowship for Emerging Activists. Debanuj holds a BA in Sociology from Presidency College in uh, Kolkata and an MA in Geography and Urban Planning from the University of Akron, Ohio. Debanuj's work has been published in the Disability Studies Quarterly, Contemporary South Asia, The Scholar and Feminist Online, South Asian Magazine for Action and Reflection, Makeshift, and The White Crane Journal. That's a lot. It's a lot of academic stuff. Um, the point is, he's done a lot of work on the issues that he cares most about, and I'm happy that he's here to share um, his knowledge, his research, and his, his lived experience um, as an immigrant from India with us today. Devanush, thank you for being here. Thank you. Thank you for having me. We can give him a warm welcome. You can turn it off, I think. Hi, everyone. Thanks for coming. Thanks for coming in the middle of the afternoon. And I'll, I am caffeinated. I don't know about you guys. So I'll try to keep this moving and exciting for all of us. Um, thanks, Tammy, for having me here, Tamara Coleman Hill. We were both, as she said, New Voices Fellows. And we worked together. She was working on reproductive justice issues. And I have been working on immigration reform. And that kind of activist policy organizing in communities of color, in immigrant communities, inform my research today. So I'm very excited to bring some of that here. I'm also very excited to listen to all of our stories, um, family or community stories related to immigration. Um, so, okay, uh, with that, let us start. My focus today is understanding race, gender, sexuality, and the United States immigration. How does race, gender, and sexuality frame US immigration policy? What are the connections between these three? Sometimes they're very obvious, sometimes they are not. And we'll also think vice versa, like how is our ideas of border how is present immigration, the fight for immigration reform, 
our border security, how do they influence the way our, um, the way U.S., the way race is formed in the United States, race relations and gender and sexuality. So from the get-go, I want to understand and we'll collectively work through this, is how does immigration influence the formation of race, gender, sexuality in America? And how does race, gender, sexuality inform immigration policies in the US? Oh, all right. So today's objectives, we'll work on a historical timeline, hence all of this, and I'll explain the, pro the, the specific exercise. We'll understand the historical timeline of US immigration policy, so we can all come together on a basic same page. We'll work to understand, as I said, how race, class, gender, sexuality is intertwined with immigration, mixed with immigration. So, is anyone here taken an intro to sociology or a women's studies class and is familiar with the concept of intersections or has heard the word intersections, intersections of identities over here? Anyone? Okay, all right, not to put your class on the blast, but we, we will think through that. We'll think through how each of these categories, race, gender, sexuality, intersect with each other, and they intersect in our lives, right? I'm not just an immigrant. I'm not just a man of color. I'm also, you know, I'm, I identify as gay, so all these three race, gender, my immigration status, my nationality, like intersect in my life, right? So I'm not just an immigrant Indian. I'm also many, many other things. And they don't exist separately in my lives. They're everyday part of my lives. <clears throat> and then we'll talk about how to share our own life stories in order to communicate the everyday impact of US immigration laws. So I think there is a rich, rich, you know, sources of data, a lot of knowledge within our own lives. Um, you know, in our everyday lives, in our everyday interactions, how our family, our schools, our places of worship, you know, what we are doing there and where we come from, each of us bring our own stories, right? And these stories are very powerful places to begin. When I teach in my classroom, I always begin with my and my students' stories. Students, we each of us bring our own stories and that's a rich place to go to understand large abstract concepts. So we learn how to share our own life stories in order to communicate the everyday impact of US immigration laws and we'll discuss some ideas how to take charge and take action for changing unjust laws. So these are kind of the four objectives I thought of. Is there anything else you guys wanted to get out of this conversation today? Okay. So, with that we'll go into our first exercise and we have about half an hour, um, about 20 minutes to go through this, 20 minutes. Uh, it's called the US Immigration History Timeline. You will start from that end of those chairs and walk through. Each of these images represent different moments in US immigration history, US immigration law. You will read through them and as you read through them, think about either your own immigration history or your family's immigration history. Write a few words about them, a few sentences on the stickies and stick them either on a date or an issue that's relevant to the story. If you don't find an exact date, stick them in between. Does that make sense? Okay. so. I have, um, I, the outline is pretty much there. Since there's quite a few from this immigration history timeline exercise, I'll just take some quick answers.
We've got a mic. What struck you from this immigration history timeline? You can just, for this one, you can just shout out some words because we'll just do a quick brainstorm. Anything that first comes to your mind when you walk through the timeline? Racism. Other words? Just give me a few words first. Segregation. Segregation. Others? Hatred. Hatred. There was one in the back? Russian. Russian. Oppression. Oh. <laughs> Anything else? A couple of other words? Fear. You want to say a little bit more about that? So mainly because of what Communities didn't know about what seemed like foreign or racial communities. There was a fear about that. Bravery. 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 Why do you say that? Maybe we'll take the mic for now. Um, well, mostly from post-it notes when looking at it's just really inspiring to see uh, families that took the leap and against, you know, odds or fear against their, you know, facing things that might they might be afraid of. They came anyway for a better life. A lot of post-it notes say hoping for a better life and stuff like that. So better life, hoping for a better life. I think that's a key one because most immigrants come to this country, the land, the land of the free and the promised, for, you know, the land of promise. So looking for a better life. A couple of more words, maybe this side of the room. Sorry? Uncertainty. Uh, uncertainty. Why? Maybe we'll take that. Um, because a lot of the families that came were maybe immigrants and they weren't really sure what to expect or how they would support themselves and the fear of not wanting to look for a job or being caught or being sent back. Okay, so they didn't know what to expect or how their lives would play out, if they would get a job or not, if they would get caught or sent back. So uncertainty. Um, so which moments in history did you connect with? Yeah, stand up maybe? Yeah, yeah. 1955. 1955, here, she's giving you a microphone. 1955. Uh, Tell us more. Rosa Parks. Um, the thing that got me was, and I wrote it down on my little sticky notepad, was because my grandmother, she was like spit on for like just drinking off from a from a whites only fountain, you know. Mm -hmm. So that's the one like I could have related to because she was like, hey y'all, you know, it's just a seat, you know. Let me sit down, you know. And right. It's like, hey, it's just a fountain. I'm thirsty, you know. Let me drink from it, you know. And do you want to say what if you whatever you know of Rosa Parks? What did she do? Well, I mean, I really don't get into all that like that. I'm just being real, you know. Okay. But yeah. like from experience, from what my family tell me, you know, right? I could just like relate a little bit, you know. No, that's important because what our family tells us is an important source of knowledge, and we. We walk around with this, with these stories, what our parents or grandparents or friends or cousins tell us. Especially for around stories of race and immigration, this is where the rich story is, not in the history books. Because a lot of our stories have been omitted from history books. So I want us to go to what our grandma told us, or what our cousin told us, what our mom told us, or did not tell us, but we might know from looking through the family album. So does that, what surprised you? Did you, were you, when you heard US immigration history timeline, were there certain things that you saw that, that is part of this timeline 
that surprised you that was here that you thought did not really belong here? You know, faculties can answer. <laughs> I love putting faculties in blast. <laughs> yeah. All right, I'll, I'll, I'll t take the gauntlet. Uh, I was just intrigued why uh, you started at 1492, because if I thought of immigrants, I, I, I might say everyone is truly an immigrant, so why not think of Native Americans or first people? I mean, granted they were here first, but at the same time they're also immigrants in the same way that other people are. Right, because do you want to say a little bit about sort of some geographic history, there are some narratives about how First Nation people got here? Sure, I mean, there, I mean you could, I mean, <laughs> I'm not an expert, I suspect you know more than, than I do on sure. this topic. Sure, neither am I, that's uh, but But there's also, I mean, the, the idea that there is just like first people in one place and they didn't move around, and so like if you wanted to talk about like the Iroquois, well, the Iroquois were pretty nice, except for when they weren't and they were really murderous and awful to other people, but boy, they had a nice, form of government after a while, but then there are other groups and other people that got replaced, and I mean, there's just thousands and thousands of years of history, so mm -hmm, mm -hmm. why did you start at uh, 1492 with Columbus? Okay, well, the thing is, this historical timeline has been, uh, as an exercise, was created by the National Network for Immigrant and Refugee Rights, NNIRR, and when I worked with them, we collectively created this. So, this is a, build, a project we can build on. So. What you just brought up about a longer history of First Nation people <coughs> either being here or ruling each other or moving through the continent in different parts, both North and South Americas, could be a longer. And it also ends at 2001, 2003. There are stuff missing here, so we can definitely go there. So anything else that surprised you? Yes, you had your hands up, right? Mm -hmm. You're asking about how the original, um, what Nat Native Americans, how they got here. Yeah. So I just want to give a little insight. They came from, uh, I don't know exactly, it was during the Ice Age. And yeah. the sea, the Bering Sea uh, near Alaska was frozen, so that's how they migrated from here. That's why they sort of resemble Eastern Asian descent and mm -hmm. uh, Pacific Island descent. Mm -hmm. That's why mm -hmm. they're here because of the Ice Age, they migrated from there. So that is, that is a very standard, you know, ecological, geographic sort of theory about how what we think today as First Nation people, different uh, indigenous tribes got to the Americas. Whether or not it's completely scientific truth, that's not important. But what comes out for me through that story <coughs> is that we all carry long histories of migration. Migration is a part of both human and animal experience on this universe. So it is, it is a natural human animal fact that people, you know, people, plants, and animals move. You know, some plants only reproduce through movement through the ocean. So migration is part of our lives. It has been a truth of the universe for a very long time. Okay, anything else coming back to this timeline? Did you see some things that you weren't expecting to see in an immigration history timeline? Why do you, yeah? that that would be on there because most of them were probably already born here or came from like way farther back generations. Right. So some of the civil rights stuff strikes people when we do this workshop as to why is stuff around civil rights activism, civil changes in laws related to African Americans on this immigration history timeline. Well, if we go back to the history of slavery in the United States to the civil rights law, we see very clearly Around this, it's right after the civil rights law, the passage of the civil rights law around 1961 to 1968, that we see the reform in Immigration and Nationality Act in 1969. In 1960, up until then, United States immigration law had racial and national categories 
and that had quotas. Not everyone was allowed, um, especially like Northern European countries were given preference over Eastern European countries and countries of Asia. It's only in 1969, after the civil rights law got passed, we see this reform. So it's very important to understand how race inside the country is connected with immigration law. You had your hand up? Yeah. I had a question about immigration policy that was around in the time where Asia, China, um, like there was a time period where America had set up laws so that like very little, like mainland Chinese can come here. I'm not sure what time period that was. I think it was during like that early 1960s, 1970s, 1950s time period because of the uh, fall of the original Demo democratic government and then the uprise of the uh, communist party. Right, so there's a long history of that. Well, if we go back, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. the Chinese Exclusion Act is really early. One of the first um, exclusion acts is based on the Chinese Exclusion Act, and I'm thinking it's in the 1830s to the 1840s. I can't trace it over here. So, um, and that was the fear of the Chinaman, and that was in the 1830s to the 1840s. It was related to um, the opium wars and related to the f this fear that Chinese immigrants were opening up opium shops in America and spreading addiction and disease. So that was one of the first race-based exclusion acts. Um, and later on, the fear of communism, the fear of communists, anarchists, and uh, gay and lesbian people coming into the country and infecting the country or bringing communism to the country is a huge fear. And, uh, if we see that, especially in the 1950s, during the McCarthy era, Senator McCarthy was a sen senator who ran these kind of communist witch hunts. So anything else that struck you really quickly? Um, did you see issues around labor in this immigration history timeline? What kind of labor issues got connected with this? Or where did you find your family story or your story? I'll just take a couple of them. Where did you stick your sticky? <laughs> yeah, a couple of your own answers. You've clearly stuck them here. <laughs> yeah. In the 60s, and what kind of timeline did you, what was happening around that? Uh, I honestly have no Where idea. did you stick it? <laughs> I sticked it in the early 60s. Early 60s. Yeah. 61 to 68, is that you? Yeah, probably. So 1961 to 68, in the early 60s, we see in 16, uh, we see a lot of the activism, the civil rights activism happening, right? And where did your mom came, come from? Poland. Poland. Yeah. So, so our, our family's histories are always connected to what's happening globally, right? Or what's happening nationally. Anyone else, where did you stick your family or your own immigration history? Yeah. Um, uh, Mexican Revolution. Was it the Mexican Revolution? I don't know. 1840. That's 1840. That's, it was 1840. Um, 1840, I think. Uh, it was. Um, both my parents came mm -hmm. from. It, it's it's in relation to the 1980s. That's around the time my parents came to America, and um, is Israeli oppression in uh, today Israel was. Uh, very uh, inflicting on my uh, family, so part like parts of my family would move uh, moved from uh, Isra Israel to uh, America because of um, oppression, and there was a lot of discrimination. And as you can see on the map today, territories have reduced down to only 
small parts of what it originally was. And so that's why it relates to And Israel. is your family from Israel? They're Palestinian. They're okay, they're Palestinian. They're Palestinian. They're from Israel. So in the 1940 onwards when the yeah, Israel when the United Nations had yeah. refugees. So 1940s, we, have, we see huge Israel-Palestinian war. Um, United Nations forms Israel, kind of divides the map. Right, that's a quick sort of crassly talking about that history, but that history is very important because that connects to how Palestinian communities and other Israeli communities found themselves in a lot of difficulty, and some of them came to the United States, and that history actually frames Arab Americans as a racial category in the United States. You know, first Arab Americans were considered as white, but not so white in Americas in the in the 70s and the 80s, and then it became through this, in the 60s there was this LA5, the scare of LA8. These were eight professors and activists who were arrested and deported because they were distributing materials related to Palestine. And then 9-11 onwards, Arab Americans are increasingly racially targeted, right? So these kinds of broad histories connect with immigration timeline. I'll take one more story really quickly. One, where did you stick your history or your family's? Yes. I think mine was around. Uh, Hold on just a sec. I uh, believe mine was around 1910. Mm -hmm. um, because if I remember right from the stories that were uh, told from my great grandpa, it was that we were part of the IRA. And then... What is the IRA? The Irish Republican Army. Right. Uh -huh. And then, like, parts of the family got caught, and then we had to leave, and so then we came to America. Right. That's very important. Thank you for bringing that up. So we see that in the, in the 1910s, where is it? The history of the IRA. In the 1910s, in the 19... 19 onwards, between that period, we see huge amounts of Irish and Polish immigrants coming. And part of the IRAs, uh, uh, part of the Irish history is twofold. There's famine in the early, early 20th century, and there's relationship with IRA, as he has mentioned, part of the Irish Republican Army. So we see from our own family stories how coming to the United States and how we locate ourselves after coming here. It's not just something, a, a matter of domestic history. Yes? Um, why do you think people think of America as having um, Irish history before the war? Um, Irish were treated, treated poorly as well when they first came over. They were kind of made a mockery of. Yeah, can you tell say more? Yeah, yeah, so when my grandpa came over, he was 14 years old, and it was very difficult for him to find a job because there were cartoons coming out and whatnot of, you know, Irish being drunks and happy and whatever. So I just think that there was discrimination. Right, absolutely. And that's a very important part of Irish and Polish history is that, especially there's all these jokes of us about Irish paddy wagon, that's how the term paddy wagon comes, that Irish were, and it, it relates to uh, United States history with, with England. You know, that Irish were made fun of as lesser educated, as drunks, as dangerous, as rowdy, not as cultured. And there's a really great book, if you get a chance, read it. It's called How the Irish Became White. And it's a history of what we call as white in the United States is not just plain white, right? There's, mul there's we bring, and many of my white friends bring, with the history of the term white, different ways that white has been framed. And I think what one, one thing the term white does is it covers over different family histories. As our lady here, our friend here has pointed out in the history of Irish Americans, history of Polish Americans, it's very different from history of you know, anyone who came from England or anyone who, had, who came as the, some of the first pilgrims and can trace their histories back to the 1700s, which is most of the New England area. Okay, so we'll move on from there. 
Um, do, you, do you think something was missing in the timeline or do you think any of these trends are still ongoing today? Anything missing from this timeline? Yes. Um, I, I think that, is this on? Yeah. I think the, the trend of, um, as she just suggested, Irish coming in and being discriminated against, and each wave of new immigrants had an, an experience of discrimination in this country. And I think we're, we're currently looking at, because there's such a large number of um, Latino um, immigrants coming in, we're sort of looking at that particular group in, sort of in some ways a very similar wave of immigration. So I think it's kind of a constant thing. Mm -hmm. I don't know if it's something that will end depending on you know people coming in and, and that natural movement that you've talked about for obviously very different reasons. Right, right. So as Tamara has pointed out, one of the trend that continues is that people from multiple parts of the world in, in during different time frames, there is always an immigration wave. And as we know right now, there is a large amount of immigration come happening from Latin American countries, what we call Latino Latina communities, and a large amount of newer immigration happening in Eastern Europe from Eastern European countries. After the demise of the Soviet bloc, anyone anyone's family here from Eastern Europe or recent Eastern European immigration? Do you have friends who are here from Eastern Europe or students in your class? Yeah. You have a friend, okay. Cool. Just came recently? Uh, yeah. From where? Um, Lithuania. Lithuania. So these trends continue, and how Eastern European immigrants are treated today is a very interesting thing to see if many of them will be incorporated into the whiteness in this country or not. It's a questionable thing. So there are different trends to, to see through. Okay. <clears throat> So I want to move to the second section of our presentation, having gone through this. Many of you have written some of your own narratives or family narratives and, and found historical moments or timelines or date periods where you can connect to it. So what I want to say is that I have been hinting towards this over and over again, that owning our own stories, telling our own stories is very important. And why? Because our personal narrative can give us a global perspective. It can, you know, uh, our stories, when we talk about them within a classroom setting, what we can do is whatever we are reading, like whatever we are reading here today, we can find these broad trends, how they are showing up in our personal stories, right? We, are we, are, we were beginning to find broad trends, historical trends, how the Irish would made fun of, the history of civil, uh, you know, civil, uh, civil rights, how a grandma told a story. These stories, we can connect them with broader historical trends. And once we start doing that, we are developing an analysis. We are developing an analysis of race, gender, sexuality, in this case, an immigration history. So I want us to begin from our personal narrative and then understand how the global is per part of our personal stories. And I am always inspired by poet Audre Lorde, who is an African-American, Afro-Caribbean lesbian poet. Um, she was poet laureate of uh, New York. And she is a woman of color. Uh, one of her famous books is called The Cancer Journals. In the 80s, she was diagnosed with breast cancer, and she kept a diary in her hospital. And she wrote about her mastectomy, how she discovered cancer, and she wrote a book based on that. And it is one of the biggest books now in understanding uh, how to write about disability in disability studies. And what she says is knitting a weave from our lives, you know? Um, so knitting from our everyday lives, these stories can tell us how to think about global perspectives. So I'm, what I'm going to do is I'm going to present a lyrical fragment from my own immigration experience as a way of thinking through, as a way of thinking through, so we'll go to the video now, 
as a way of thinking through how to own your own story or your family's own story and how to say that for a public. And as Tamara, Tammy mentioned, I just gave a recent TED talk at The Ohio State University and this is my TED talk. Thought I made a sensible shoe choice today going with flats, but after that TED talk, I'm thinking the heel could have made a more powerful impression on you guys. Here to learn, right? Here to learn. Our next speaker is Devanuj Dasgupta. And I've been thinking a lot about how we communicate information about ourselves. I had to decide how to introduce myself to all of you today. Last Friday, I had to answer that question, tell us about yourself, in a job interview. And I'm already scheming on that next Instagram caption, even though I just learned that there are better things for me to be focusing on. Reflecting on these ways that I share bits of information about myself brought me to this realization. The most powerful way to do so is by being vulnerable and sharing our complete story. But this takes confidence and courage and is thus no easy task. Debanaj Dasgupta will take the stage next to tell you his story. Once an undocumented immigrant, Debanuj will take you through his journey of shame and stigma related to an HIV diagnosis. Now a scholar and an activist, Debanuj's research within the social sciences is largely shaped by his own story through a method called autoethnography. And now, a story whose telling I won't delay any further, Debanuj Dasgupta. terrorist, disease, thief. Are these some of the words that come to you when I say undocumented immigrants, refugees? Or do you think of us as those escaping persecution, disaster, seeking home, belonging? Today in the media, our politicians are talking about undocumented immigrants and refugees in a very negative frame. Undocumented immigrants are called criminals, aliens who deserve to be detained and deported, thrown back to our countries of origins because we violated the law. Refugees are called potential terrorists. Maybe they bring disease to America, or feared as too expensive to be brought here. Today, I want to share with you two stories from my life as an undocumented immigrant in order to help you flip the script about undocumented immigrants and refugees. So in 2002, my immigration application for permanent residency to the United States got approved. I was super excited. Um, my dream of becoming an established researcher was probably gonna come true. I may now have access, hopefully, to institutions of amazing higher learning and research. Maybe, Maybe I would be able to have better income, save money, and support my parents when they retire. However, when I was going through the regular medical exam as a part of the adjustment of status process, I learned that I was living with HIV. Not only was I worried about my long-term health, I was seriously afraid about my legal status in the United States. As a researcher of immigration, I knew there exists an HIV ban on immigration. The span existed from 93 up until 2010. Now, when the ban was passed, people didn't know much about HIV. There wasn't medication. People were dying in mass. However, even though in 96, there was combination therapies discovered that halted the spread of HIV in our blood, this ban on immigration existed. 
So in 2002, I was scared that if my HIV status was put on my immigration file, immigration would null and void my application, even though it was approved, and I would be detained and sent back home. How would I face my parents? What would I tell them? That their only son was sent back home because he's living with HIV. I could see their shame and pain. So I decided to hide, not even seek treatment, um, discontinue communication with my lawyer. And in July 4th, 2004, when the entire country was celebrating American Independence Day, you know, firecrackers were going off, I was shivering with high fever in my bedroom in Brooklyn. My tongue was dry, it's dry right now, but my tongue was dry, I was shivering, sweating, I found two purple lesions on my either hands and foot. At this point, I knew I have Kaposi sarcoma and pneumonia. All of these can, can be halted very easily at this point by treatment. So my friends assembled around me. They decided they would take me to St. Vincent's Hospital in downtown Brooklyn, oh, Manhattan. And I was going to change my legal name from Devanuj Gupta to Dulal Sen for accessing treatment. I remember that first night in the hospital bed very, very well. I was sweating profusely. My tongue was dry. I could feel hot and cold at the same time. Fragile body. My best friend, Rodrigo, sitting next to me, holding me, changing my nightgown and bed sheet every hour and powdering me. And from that from that window of 14th floor of St. Vincent's, I could see a sliver of West Village. I could see my favorite cafe where I used to hang out. I could feel Rodrigo's touch, warm hands on my cold body. And I told myself I was not going to die. I was not going to die because I was not going to give up on my life and I was going to live not just to tell my story, but every other immigrant story. And I did live. I lived, but in 2008, as I was taking the bus from Akron to, Colum uh, to New York to access my medication and go through my regular blood work, um, immigration raided the bus. ICE found me and declared me as illegal. At this point, I'm being taken into detention. My worst nightmare is coming true. Remember, I was trying to avoid this all the while. I'm shackled, my legs and arms, and taken into a single cell where it's my bed and the toilet. For the first four nights, I told I'm not going to break down, I'm not going to cry, I, because I need to get out of this place and stay strong for myself. On the fifth night, I couldn't take it anymore. A single dark cell without any stimulation. Sitting there, I could smell my own human piss. And this was not going to be part of my story. This dark cell, and I couldn't take it anymore, and I broke down. And I cried so loud that the guy next to me, he was from Dominican Republic, he heard me and he said, Indian, Indian, don't cry. Because if anyone can get out of this cell, it's you. And when you get out, tell the world our story. And probably he thought I have two master's degrees, I speak English, maybe I could get representation and get out. I did. I fought my immigration case. I didn't give up. I stand in front of you today as a legal permanent resident of the United States doing research on refugee and immigration issues. So. So when you hear our, your politicians talk about undocumented immigrants and refugees as criminals, as aliens, think about me. Think about me dying alone in that hospital bed with my friend trying to save me. 
Think about me alone shackled in a detention cell. Is this justice? Is this the greatness that America stands for? Think again. my choice of tie, but I'll change, hopefully. <laughs> hopefully I'll have a better outfit. But anyways, that's just me. I pester over clothes quite a lot. Um, presentation is important, right? So anyways, I uh, the reason I shared a lyrical fragment from my life is I want us all to go to a brave space where we can carve stories from our, from our lives whether or not it's related to immigration. But if it is related to immigration, like it took me a while to think if I wanted to tell about my own detention and my HIV story in public, and this is going to be made into a video, it's gonna be available for anyone and everyone, any point of their lives, right? <clears throat> it was very triggering when I first started rehearsing for TED Talks. I had to keep going back to my therapist. I cried a lot, there were lots of memories came back. But this whole process is a process of creating knowledge, working through my own body. There is a lot of memory in my own body, in our bodies. Our bodies store memory. And this memory is a well off place to go to, to carve it into a knowledge about immigration. Each of our families, many of your friends, people in your communities probably carry a history of immigration probably carry stories of detention and deportation. And it is really important to tell these stories. So <clears throat> I want to take, we're coming towards an end, so I'll take four volunteers who stand up, come up front one by one, and just like locate your family story if you can read it a little bit, and then we can sort of unpack it. Maybe we'll take three because we're running out of time. We'll see if we can do four. So three to four volunteers. Who wants to go? OK, I have one. I have two. See, your peers are doing it. You can do it. I have three, one more. You guys want to start coming up front, and then we can start with one of you. All right, we have four. Great. Yeah, sure. Yeah, so read your story, and then we'll talk a little bit more. Introduce yourself, maybe. Hi guys, I'm Lily. Uh, majority of my family immigrated from, well all my family, all my family is from Mexico and the latest that I know from dating back from is probably a little over 70 years ago, when, 70 years ago when my grandpa Seven came. or 70? 70. 70, you wanna hold it up closer. Sorry. That's okay. Um, I know that my grandpa on my mom's side came here. Um, he doesn't necessarily know why, it was more of like, his, mom cho his mom's choice, he was a little bit younger. But I know on my dad's side, it's more recent. My grandma immigrated here. It's because she had a better job offering here. Unfortunately, she had to leave my dad back in Mexico for a couple of years to kind of like establish herself here. And then he immigrated here when he was around six years old. And on that side of the family, I'm the kind of like first generation here like established, which is pretty cool. And Lily, what? Where did you go and put your story? Where did you, what did you find there? Can you read what's on there? Yeah, oh, okay. yeah. Um, in go for it. <laughs> in 1951, United Nations Refugees Convention is signed defining rights for refugees, including um, protections for employment and welfare. On this issue of identity papers and travel documents, 
the convention is amended in 1967 to apply to all people who became refugees after 1951. Okay, so, and your, your grandmother came in 1951? Uh, it was my grandpa, I'm a, I kinda just rough, I kinda just roughly did the math and assumed it was in near the 50s. Great, great. So I think this is a great way of talking about what was happening around that time, what was, what's clearly happening in 1951, is post-World War II, the United Nations comes to uh, an agreement about refugees. And there is a covenant against torture, and there is what we today call political asylum process, is an, is an outgrowth of that process, an agreement that people fleeing wars, disasters, persecution, have a right to protection um, in, in other countries. So around that time, these are kind of the sort of dialogues that are happening. Are there some of the labor stuff that you connected with or that you think is connected with your family's history? Did you see anything else that kind of connects? Not that I could, not that I could think of. Thanks, okay. Lily. Okay. You want to introduce yourself? I'm Iris. Hello. Um, I don't know much about it, but my great grandma came to the U.S. from Ireland. Say she was like 30 or something, and she left my grandma in Ireland because she couldn't take care of her. And then my grandma came over to the U.S. on boat when she was 16 by herself to be reunited and meet her mom for the first time. And yeah, I don't know what she even did as a career. I don't think she did anything. She Which married year was somebody. that? Around what time was that? 1945. And where did you stick your story? What was happening around that time? You um, want to read it for us? 1943, the Bracero program brings in over 5 million temporary workers from Mexico, mostly to fill agricultural labor shortage during World War II. OK. So as we can see in the 1950s, a lot of stuff is connected with World War II or post-World War II. There was a shortage in labor in the United States, agricultural farm laborer. And what we today call the Bracero program was created to bring in farm workers from Mexico um, who worked on agricultural farms. And we see that trend continuing even today, right? We have farm workers, both legal and undocumented, who are working in farms, like plucking tomatoes and stuff. I come from Columbus right now. Columbus is the headquarter for Wendy's. Anybody likes Wendy's boy, like baked potatoes here? No, okay, I love it. You love it? Okay, cool. But I had to stop eating Wendy's because the top 10 you know, food chains, uh, big like McDonald's, Burger King, everyone except Wendy's agreed to give farm workers a one cent pay raise per pound of tomatoes that they pick. Everyone but Wendy's. Wendy's is headquartered in Columbus, and farm workers and students are organizing in Wendy's. So the history of farm workers is very much connected with the need for cheap labor in the United States. And you brought up a very important point about how women migrate to this country. We don't talk. When we think of immigrants, we think of guys, right? Let's be frank. What's the, what's the sort of face we think of? We don't think of single mothers you know, women who are immigrating to escape poverty from their countries and how they reunite with their children. So that's an important story. Thanks, Lily. Yes? Yeah. My name's Ade. Uh, my parents are from Palestine. They came around the 1980s. I think my mother was... You want to hold it close very close. Sorry, yeah. Um, my father came here in 1980s and my mother came here, I think, like 1990 or 1989 somewhere around that time. And um, my dad came from Jordan. He's originally from Palestine, but he left Palestine because of the oppression. Like there was um, big, huge tensions between uh, Israelis and Palestinians, and he had to leave because there was way too much uh, conflict. And he was living in uh, one of the territories that um, now, now today is Israeli territory. Mm -hmm. But back then he had um, he was forced to move from there, and he moved from Jordan. And from there, he um, he was always distracted from the conflicts, so he really didn't uh, focus on school there. He 
didn't do so well in school. He joined the military for um, either six to eight years, I think. U.S. military? Uh, no, not U.S. Not Kay. U.S. Uh, Jordanian. Okay. And then from there, while he was in the Jordanian army, my grandfather was doing his uh, papers for immigration to the United States. And my mother, I honestly don't really know much other than that she came from she came from Palestine because um, there was heavily heavy, con heavy conflict there, and so she came there, and then that's how I got married. But and where did you put your story? Nineteen, what? I mean, uh, 1846 to 1848. What, you, wh what was going American, on? Mexican American War. Uh, U.S. invades Mexico for control of land and resources. Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo was signed in 1848, transferring all over 55% of Mexican land to U.S. Sounds very similar to uh, late 1940s, early 1950s uh, transfer of um, majority of uh, Zionist Jewish background uh, immigrants into Palestine. So there's a big relation there. So huge geopolitical conflicts that frame territories and change changes maps overnight it's connected with people's oppression and movement across borders. Yes. Thank you. Hi, everybody. My name is Amjad. Um, so I'm first-generation American. My dad moved here when I was about 10 years old, and I actually didn't live here first. Um, I was born in Colombia. My grandparents moved there from um, Jordan, I'm assuming, and uh, because of the Arab um, conflict with Palestine as well. Um, other than that, I don't know much about them. And where are you uh, sort of situating your story? What time uh, frame? I did like the last paper over there. You want to read that for us, please? Uh, so Closer to your mouth. Uh, it says loved ones uh, and civil liberties. Uh, events of September 11 attack set the stage for national security based immigration policy. Congress passes the Patriot Act, which gives the federal government a, a board pro power to det detain sus suspected terrorists for unlimited uh, periods of time without access to legal representation, uh, where over 1,200 out of Muslims and South Asian men were detained secretly. Okay, so as so 2001, 2003, you know, 2001 September 11th happened, which was terrorist attacks on the Twin Towers and Pentagon, right? So around that time, national security intensifies, right? So what we first see is the passage of the USA Patriot Act. And then we see the passage of Real ID Act, which secures borders, airports, gives broad powers to the Congress to sweep in on multiple communities, follow our you know, phone conversations, internet exchanges. So and in 2001, 2003, special registration was also passed, which meant men between the ages of 18 to I think it was 60 who had to register um, comp uh, with the FBI, Muslim men from certain countries, and they had to return again a year later to inform th their whereabouts. So we can see how a history of needs of labor, of people escaping poverty and persecution, women escaping poverty and persecution, history of national security and fear, as someone had pointed out in the beginning, frame our life stories, right? Frame stories about immigration. I think you guys can take a seat. We should give all of them a round of applause. Um, any, any quick thoughts? What are you feeling or thinking at this point? You wanna, you wanna bring up something that you think is missing in this conversation or you might disagree with so far? Yeah. Hold on. Will amplify your voice. Um, I think it's really sad when I didn't know about the during World War II. Was it that we 
had an agreement where we were bring, gonna bring in a lot of workers because we needed them. And that now all of the talk is go get everybody out of here. Um, mm. I mean, not, all, not now, like in this room, but <laughs> politically, um, mm -hmm. I think that's really sad. Like it's just an abuse of immigration. Mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. When we need it, we'll take it. And if we don't need it, then hey, get out of here. Right. I think that's a very important point, and we can actually move on to the next one. But I want to stay on that a little bit. America, when we think about United States, is always painted as a nation of immigrants, right? Like, that's kind of the pride point. America, the country, the nation of immigrants. So think about the statue in Ellis Island, you know, Statue of Liberty, give me your tired, you're hungry. You know, sort of that is kind of the image that we is portrait of America, but it's a schizophrenic relationship with immigration. As I can, as we can all see, it's based on. A, but then there's the other side: the fear, the deportation, the the racial stereotyping, the policing, the throwing out and detaining. So it's a schizophrenic relationship with immigration. This country has. There, this is a country of immigrants. You can come here. You can make it. This is a country of, well, we need a border. We need a wall today, right? This is some of the this is some of what we are hearing in this political cycle. Now, I'm not going to go too much into that because <coughs> that's beyond today's scope. So what's going on right now? I wanted to point out to the heightened amount of detention and de deportation that is happening in, our, in the United States right now. Any immigrant who has overstayed their visa it's considered as illegal, what I call as undocumented. Even the New York Times has taken the word illegal out of their phrase and uses undocumented. And we can see the United States has the largest immigrant detention infrastructure in the world, with over 400,000 individuals passing through detention each year. The expansion of the system is in part due to an arbitrary quota. Once again, we have a quota. Congress requires the incarceration of 34,000 immigrants in detention at any given time. So every night, there should be at least 34,000 detainees in, every, in a detention bed altogether, nationwide. So every night, as we go to bed, there's 34,000 people who are in single cell, along with many other incarcerated people in this country who are in detention. So this policy known as the detention bed quota is unprecedented. No other law enforcement agency operates on a quota system. So can we go to the video real quick? And we all know there's a lot of anti-detention organizing happening right now. Um, so we'll, I just wanted to go quickly to a video of transgender detainees uh, fighting de detention yeah, deportation. Today at 8 a.m., trans and queer immigrant activists form a triangular human chain, leaned to a metal cage, blocking the intersection at the entrance of the Santana Police Department to call on the city of Santana to terminate its contract with ICE, which imprisons trans and queer people, detained in inhumane conditions. So we came here to shut down the county jail here, which has LGBTQ immigrants detained. We had um, five people getting arrested today in a cage and wrapped up in a cage in the middle of the intersection. Um, the police came after about an hour and a half, but we were able to make noise and show the President Obama that it's time to stop deportations. It was a very powerful statement elevating LGBTQ voices and making sure our community was heard. This LGBTQ civil disobedience was led by trans and queer immigrant activists as part of the Not One More deportation campaign. Those risking arrest are directly impacted by deportation. And we're asking the police to stop the criminalization of all trans and queer communities. Our communities have faced disproportionate amount of violence, both in the streets and by the police and in the detention centers. And we're asking not one more and stop the violence and stop the criminalization of queer and trans bodies. We're here to demand a stop to our deportations, to free our queer trans and brothers, sisters and brothers that are in the detention centers under inhumane conditions. The Obama administration has deported a record number of more than 2 million people, including many LGBTQ undocumented immigrants. Valeria de la Luz, a transgender Latina who was recently released from an immigration detention center in San Diego, explains. Estamos 
aquí en esta marcha en contra de las deportaciones, en contra del encarcelamiento que afecta a nuestra comunidad gay, ya que aquí en Santana hay una de las seis cárceles en Estados Unidos que donde tienen en condiciones infrahumanas a mucha gente de nuestra comunidad. During this action, five LGBTQ immigrant activists were arrested. This direct action aims to lift up the voices of more than 267,000 undocumented LGBTQ immigrants and call for liberation, not deportation. Chose this, um, this immigrant action is because I wanted to highlight at the end of this, they give a data and it's taken from the Congressional Budget Office that out of the supposedly 1.5 million undocumented people, there is 267,000 LGBT undocumented immigrants in this country. So when we think about detention and undocumented people, we often think of families being separated, children's being separated from their mothers or fathers. And that's a very important aspect of detention that's, that's happening in our everyday lives everywhere. What we often don't think of is that LGBT people are being put into detention. And who will come to fight for LGBT people? Because if your community is a community of friends, if you're escaping your family-based persecution from your countries of origin because you're queer, who will then come to fight for you, to get you out of detention? If you're transgender, who's seen Orange is the New Black? Anyone? So you, you guys remember Sophia's story? She didn't get, so she was a transgender, uh, the, you know, she was in prison in Orange is the New Black. They stopped giving her hormones and there was major life effect. So that's a, that's a pretty rosy you know, depiction of what happens to trans people in jail is a lot of transgender people in detention die because either they don't get HIV medication or their hormones are stopped because it's not considered as everyday medication and laceration happens, internal bleeding, and a lot of them die. A lot of them are transgender immigrants, detainees are put in the wrong gender cell and end up getting sexually harassed. So one out of 500 detainees are transgender. However, one out of every five confirmed sexual assault cases in detention are that of transgender women. So we see a high proportion of transgender undocumented women who are actually suffering more torture inside the detention. So that's why I wanted to bring up that action. Um, and I wanted to sort of ask, you know, have you seen or heard about detention in your community? I'll take a couple of stories. Do people talk about detention or deportation in your communities or your friends or in your classroom? Yeah. Um, well, they didn't actually go to a detention center, but um, I remember my aunt and two of my cousins were working in a factory before, and it was when they were doing like the roundups and they ended up hiding in the factory, they ended up trying to leave through the back door just to avoid being captured, and it was just like the fear that they were just trying to do their job, but they're still being persecuted, and the, just the fear of having to go to the detention center and not know what would happen from there. Right, right, and if a detention roundup is happening at a workplace, irrespective of whether or not you're a U.S. citizen, you might be rounded up, just the way you look. Anyone has uh, heard about Arizona, the bill that was passed, SB 1070? It's like if you look like an immigrant, you have to show your immigration papers. That was a bill that was being passed. Any other stories about detention or deportation that you've heard in your community or in your family, among your friends? Did you have your heads up? Oh, so I said it's related to deportation. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, so um, I did debate, and one of the um, debate teams that I worked with, their partner 
like no one knew until like she didn't show up enough that um, she was actually deported mm -hmm. and no one had any idea that she was undocumented, that her family was undocumented. And um, if I remember right, it was like they both had just qualified for nationals and everything, so they were both very excited. Uh, both were very, very, very bright people. Um, mm -hmm. And then it finally, like, I forgot how, but somehow we finally found out that uh, their family was uh, deported. Right. So that's another very important aspect of deportation is we don't get to hear or see how it is carried out. It's covert, it's fast, and it's also very sporadic. Once someone is taken into one detention center, they keep getting moved around. So even for family members and lawyers to get in touch with a detainee becomes very difficult. Okay. So um, we, we talked about the anti-detention organizing and the heightened detention and deportation that is happening. Someone has already brought up that immigration is a huge part of this recent political election cycle, right? We are in the middle of a presidential cycle. Um, so, you know, what can I do? I speak up. I choose to speak up around immigration issues. You know, one of the major ways to think through is learning to be an ally. Can someone say, tell me what an ally is? Has anyone heard that word? Support. Okay, so someone who's supportive. How do you think you could be supportive around immigration issues or to an immigrant friend of yours? Educate others. Okay. How would you be supportive? Yeah. Yeah. That's a very important thing to be an ally, is to just shut up and listen. Just to listen. I often forget to shut up when my mother talks about how she's sick and tired of her life. You know. But shut up and listen. Yeah, it's important. And to figure, because when I actively listen, I can figure out where someone needs help rather than impose my ideas of how to help that person. Some other things, how, how can we help as an ally, let's say, to our undocumented friends? What can we do? Yes. Just a second, let's get this to you. Um, for us being US citizens, maybe we can um, be in contact with the congressmen, with the um, local government governors, and uh, uh, tell them and share them the stories that we hear about undocumented, undocumented people we know and maybe that can help in some laws. Right, absolutely, that's very important. You know, if I'm a permanent resident or a US citizen, to we have more legal access to lawmakers. To, so to represent the stories, to even tell the stories of our parents, our friends, to lawmakers as they're considering change. I think it's very important. That's a very important part. I will say for myself, as an educator now at Ohio State, we worked hard. Has anyone heard about DACA? Deferred Action Relief for Children. It's for young people who have lived in this, who came in with their parents as undocumented and has gone through school and college in the US and are in school and college still or looking for jobs. They have temporary relief. And so in, at Ohio State, what we have created is we have created a scholarship for DACA students. 15 undocumented students who have received relief are able to access, um, access scholarship to go to Ohio State because it's pretty expensive. Also, when I, when I work with uh, faculty members in large cities where there are larger number of DACA or undocumented students, we've had to adjust our classroom expectations. Like in New York, I was just in a teacher's workshop the other day. In New York, some of most faculty members factor in if they have Muslim or undocumented male students in their class, they factor in 15 to 20 minutes late time because they can be rounded up at any moment. And if students are not coming to class for a period of time, 
there is a way they have started to think about how to engage their family members or friends to know if they have been taken in. Because it's a part of our everyday lives. All right, I will stop on that note. And